This week we're going to address individuals with speech and language impairments. Now speech is the expression of language with sounds, and this is different from language, which is a rule-based method of communication that involves comprehension and the use of signs and symbols by which ideas are represented. And both of those are different from communication, which is an exchange of ideas, information, thoughts, and feelings. Now, speech and language impairments are high incidence disabilities, and most of the students in special education who receive services for speech and language impairments are predominantly served in the general education classroom. And you'll see that these students make up about 20% of all students who receive special education services. Let's look at our learning objectives for this week. First, you should make sure that you are able to define speech, language, and communication. Know the three of those, how they're different and how they're the same. You should be able to identify the five components of language. We'll go over those in a bit. You should be able to list three different types of speech impairments and five forms of language disorders. I'll talk about those more in just a few minutes. And you should be able to define central auditory processing disorders. I'd also like you to be able to explain the difference between a receptive and an expressive language impairment. You should have a sense of the procedures used for assessing speech and language impairments, and you should be able to explain the function of augmentative and alternative communication devices. As you go through this work throughout the week, break it up into chunks and work some on some days and a little bit more on other days, and then quiz yourself and quiz yourself and quiz yourself so that you can really remember this content. Let's look at the nature of speech, language, and communication. Now, we've already said that speech is the expression of language with sounds, and language is the rule-based method of communication. Let's look at these five categories. First is phonology. This is the sounds characteristic of a language, rules that govern their distribution and sequencing, and the stress and intonation patterns that accompany sounds. Second is morphology. These are the rules that govern how words are formed from the basic elements of meaning. Third is semantics. These are the rules for how we string words together to form phrases and sentences, that is, the relationships among the elements of a sentence. Fourth is syntax. This is the linguistic realization of what the speaker knows about the world, that is, the meanings of words and sentences. And fifth, pragmatics. This is the social effectiveness of language in achieving desired functions. In other words, these are the rules related to how we use language in a social context. Let's look at those one more time. We have five components of language, and they are phonology, morphology, semantics, syntax, and pragmatics. And the third area of our nature of speech and language and communication is communication. Now, this involves both verbal and nonverbal behaviors. When it comes to defining speech and language impairments, we look to two major bodies. One is the American Speech Language Hearing Association, and the other is IDEA. ASHA, or the American Speech Language Hearing Association, defines a communication disorder as an impairment in the ability to receive, send, process, and comprehend concepts or verbal, nonverbal, and graphic symbol systems. A communication disorder might be evident in the processes of hearing, language, and or speech. The IDEA label for students with communication difficulties is speech and language impairments, and they're eligible for special education services if they have a communication disorder, such as stuttering, impaired articulation, a language impairment, or a voice impairment, which adversely affects a child's educational performance. When we classify speech and language impairments, we do it in three categories, speech disorders, language disorders, and central auditory processing disorders. With a speech disorder, we look at three additional categories. They can be articulation disorders. These are errors in the production of sound. Fluency disorders. These are difficulties with the rhythm and timing of speech. And voice disorders. This is when the quality of the voice is affected. With language disorders, we look at six different areas. There can be phonological disorders. These are difficulties organizing speech sounds into recognizable patterns. We can have apraxia of speech. This is the inability to control the muscles and thoughts that produce speech. 
third, morphological disorders. This is when someone adds morphemes incorrectly to words. Fourth, semantic disorders. This is a poor understanding of word meanings, difficulty finding the correct words to use. Fifth, syntactical deficits. This is difficulty with word order and sentence structure. And then sixth, pragmatic difficulties. These are problems understanding and using language in different social contexts. And the third area is central auditory processing disorders. Now, students with CAPD have difficulty processing, which means using and interpreting sounds. CAPD occurs when the ear and the brain do not work smoothly together to interpret sounds. Now, let's look at prevalence. Speech and language impairments are considered a high incidence disability, and it often occurs with other disabilities. The word we use to describe that is comorbid. Almost 20% of children who receive special education services receive those services for speech and language disorders, and preschoolers with speech and language disorders represent almost half of all preschoolers that receive special education. When we look at the etiology of speech and language impairments, remembering that etiology is the cause or set of causes of a particular condition, uh, what we know is that these speech language impairments can be considered functional or organic. Now, if it's functional, this is also known as idiopathic, uh, and this means that the cause is unknown versus organic, which means then it's caused by some identifiable problem in the neuromuscular mechanism. So in addition to classifying a, sp a speech and language impairment as functional or organic, we can also classify them based on the time of acquisition, either before birth, developmentally during childhood, or due to an injury. We also want to look at the prevention of speech and language impairments. Now, language is learned in a social context. Language has developed within the context of social relationships in virtually every known culture. And providing early language experiences is essential for children to associate sounds with objects and concepts and begin to process and use those sounds to communicate. Now let's look at some of the characteristics of speech and language impairments. We look at them in two major categories. One is expressive language and one is receptive language. When it comes to expressive language, a student might experience difficulties with the following. A limited vocabulary, incorrect grammar or syntax, excessive repetition of information, or difficulty formulating questions. If a student has receptive language impairments, this student might experience difficulties with following oral directions, understanding humor or figurative language, comprehending complex sentences, and responding to questions appropriately. As teachers, if we have concerns, we may want to recommend assessment, um, or if those of us, some of us will become speech-language pathologists. So uh, when we look at assessment, we can look at formal or informal measures. Those might be case studies, family interviews, health assessments, observations, developmental information, family dy dynamics, speech and language assessments. And then the persons who conduct those assessments are going to be professionals like teachers, speech pathologists, audiologists, neurologists, and physicians. Finally, in educational considerations, we have to remember that students with speech language impairments are predominantly served in the general education classroom. That's all I have for you for this week. Go back to the pilot shell and your text and look at the content, read, look at the videos, uh, then go back to your objectives, review those objectives, practice making sure that you can do those things like defining the words and identifying them, and then apply using the quizzes and the uh, video applications. Go and be amazing this week.